So I want to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, it's best-selling author and journalist Vicki Ward. Um, you know, I've read two of her books and countless stories she's written, and you know, I really didn't realize how much of a badass she is. Um, you know, she's done investigative pieces, uh, docu series on Jeffrey Epstein and his associates, the Murdoch family, that crazy family of attorneys in South Carolina. Um, she's written books on the Kushners, tough, tough crew. Uh, Harry Macklow, um, and she's really just taken an unvarnished, gloves-off look at how money and power works. That's kind of been the through line of her career. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk to her today about, you know, what makes a lot of these characters tick. Um, she's branched out into new areas, too, beyond books. Um, she has a podcast series coming out on September 23rd. It's called Pipeline to Power, the 40-year plan to capture the Supreme Court looking at some of the secret backroom dealings that you know, led to a more conservative court. She's working on a new book with James Patterson, pretty famous name. Um, so, and then just to rub it in, um, she was just appointed a visiting fellow at University of Oxford, and she's on the Council of Foreign Relations. So it's, it's almost too much for, for one talk, but we're, we're gonna try tonight. Um, and I want to say, too, you know, everybody can jump in with questions. The purpose of the Salon series is to, you know, be, have a dialogue. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsor tonight, Jake, uh, Jacobs PC. It's New York City's business and bankruptcy attorney. They restructure debt and equity and resolve business disputes. And, you know, as you guys know, in today's market, that's a pretty important service, restructuring debt. Um, so, you know, I want to thank those guys for, uh, for sponsoring tonight. Um, so my first question to Vicki, you know, it's, it's a side question, but how do you get on the Council of Foreign Relations? How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I want to get it on. I want to get on it. The, um, you know, it's not so different from being an investigative journalist. You have to find a way. You have to know a lot of people, and you have to try really hard. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not get onto the Council of Foreign Relations my, my first time. So it's a sort of lesson if you don't, you know, if at first you don't succeed, mm -hmm. try, try, try again. So there's not a 1-800 number you can call? No. Ah, darn. Um, well, let's talk about your most recent work, and then we're going to backtrack into real estate, because I know, obviously, I have a real estate-focused audience here. But uh, Pipeline of Power, it's, as I mentioned, coming out September 26th. And it, it, it kind of looks at the, the Federal Society and this... I think it's 40-year effort to move the Supreme Court more conservatively, and it focuses on all these Yale law students that, you know, kind of the, the insider dealings that, that happened. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what it was like to do a, a podcast, a, a, new, a new one for you? Yes. So podcast series is an audible original, um, which means that we made this from scratch, and this is something new that Audible does, so it's not a book, it's, it's a deep dive podcast. And I didn't initially even intend to write about the Supreme Court. I actually got really curious about the culture wars, and I read in the New York Times or somewhere that the police got called at Yale Law School, this tiny little campus that is the number one law school in the country, and yet, they had, they had a, a two speakers to an event that got so out of hand, the pro, there were protesters who got so out of hand that the police got called. And I was like, you know, what, why is this happening? Um, and it was really my investigation into that. Uh, and I discovered that the battles up at Yale were not really about the First Amendment. There was really a power struggle going on between the tiny little group of conservatives there. There's like, in a class of uh, 200, there may be 15 conservatives each year, but they have this little group mm -hmm. over the last 40 years has accrued so much power and influence that the other students are, are really, were really angry and resentful about um, their comparative success. So I w actually went back in time, and I don't know many, I mean, some of you may know what the Federalist Society is, some may not, but what I didn't know, that the reason we have the conservative supermajority on the Supreme Court today is the result of really careful, long-term, actually brilliant strategic planning. And 
that began in 1971 with a memo written by a lawyer called Lewis Powell before he became a Supreme Court judge. It was a confidential memo written to the Chamber of Commerce saying, you know, and it was actually not even aimed at Republicans. Mm -hmm. It was aimed at uh, big businessmen and who were fiercely anti the regulations of the 1960s. And this memo said, you know, if you want to roll back these regulations, roll back this political climate, you need to capture the court, you need to infiltrate the law schools, particularly Yale, and uh, you need to find a way to infiltrate the media. And one person who really read this memo very closely was Ronald Reagan. And in the podcast, I went to meet with Edwin Meese, who was Reagan's right hand and then attorney general. Mm -hmm. And he describes how in their car rides when Reagan was governor of California, that they would, dis you know, Reagan was really frustrated uh, with not being able to implement his social, uh, ref you know, reform uh, proposals. He completely blamed the local courts. Mm -hmm. And there was a very concrete plan once he became president to appoint like-minded people to the bench. And the story of the Federalist Society begins when the Reagan plucks law professors, conservative law professors, Robert Bork out of Yale, Antonin Scalia out of Chicago, and the remaining tiny little group of conservatives feel so isolated um, and alone and worried that conservative legal ideas will disappear um, mm. completely, that they start this thing called the Federalist Society. Mm -hmm. and that's the beginning of, I mean, they didn't plan for it to become this incredibly um, influential, uh, really political organization, but that, that's, I won't, I, I'll bore you a yeah. bit, but that's the origins. And that's, I mean, it's a sprawling type of canvas you're working with there over many decades, more, more policy driven was it, and also you had to put this in a podcast form so people could listen to it. Was that, was that tricky and a departure from some of the, the real estate stuff you've done, which is more, mm. you know, these outsized cowboys, you know, we'll get to that in a second, Maclo uh -huh. and, and Kushner and the like. Well, so writing for the ear is harder than it sounds. Um, when you write for the ear, believe it or not, you have to write for the eye because the way we, we listen um, by pic making pictures in our minds. So it was, so you have to be very tight, very graphic, very visual. And when you're writing about nine people in black robes, that's not so easy. Um, and the other thing about making a podcast that, in my experience, is very different from writing books and articles, you know, is that I tend to, you know, write my books myself. There's a funny backstory there about, regarding Harry Macklow. Um, and, you know, obviously there I have a team of editor, editors mm -hmm. uh, and fact checkers. Um, but with a podcast, it's really like being uh, on a movie set without the cameras. And it's a very, you know, you have a team of producers. There are many iterations of the script. So it was a very, it was a very, um, was at times overwhelming. Mm -hmm, Hopefully mm -hmm. it was rewarding. And there's a positive in writing a book. Yeah. It's that you're, it's a solo activity. Right. Yeah, the burden of just doing it yourself. But on the flip side, there's not a lot of people meddling the same way. <laughs> um, but, you know, Liar's Ball was probably, I'd say, side by side with The Real Deal's own book, The New Kings of New York. Uh, about the last 20 years of New York real estate. Liar's Ball is probably the best book about New York real estate there is. It's about Harry Macklow and this bet right prior to the Great Recession where he bought seven buildings for $8 billion and lost them all right on the eve of the Great Recession. And it's a story of just like epic gambling and, uh, you know, and, and losing it all. The, the first question I want to ask about it, when is the movie going to be made of that book? Oh. If people have been asking for years. No, I know. So somebody needs to option it. So please, if anyone knows <laughs> a producer, because there was an option and then it ran out of steam. As far as I know, Mike Facitelli still wants to be played by Brad Pitt. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, absolutely. In fact, I just got a call the other day. Somebody now wants to option my first book, The Devil's Casino, about Lehman Brothers, which was kind of the genesis of The Liar's Ball. So there is a market out there. Producers are looking to books 
that have stood the test of time. Yeah. And you, you initially had J.C. Chander and A24 Productions. Yeah. Is that the one that expired? They expired. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, so, you know, I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, the real estate characters you've written about in, in general. You know, how do they compare with the people you've written outside of real estate? <laughs> what kind of, the, what, what is there a through line, you know, in the real estate characters you've covered that you've seen, you know, whether it's like the outsized hubris or, hmm. you know, just the, the, the cowboy nature of it. Is there anything that, or, or Harry Macklow in particular, that really stood out to you? <laughs> and, many and did he, many and did he, things <laughs> about Harry Macklow. Um, I mean, it just as an aside, what sprang to the story that springs to mind about Harry um, relates to what I said earlier was that it took me, you know, I had to be quite ingenious to meet Harry because he absolutely wasn't going to return my phone calls. So I finally signed up to go to a, I think, a Bloomberg conference on real estate. Um, because I saw that he was speaking at three o'clock in the afternoon. So I showed up, showed up bright and early to the Bloomberg Real Estate Conference and um, Dolly Lenz was sitting there with Harriet Weintraub. And I had known Harriet from you know, being a journalist, she's in public PR. And they were like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here. I, I've got to find a way to meet Harry Macklow. And, you know, this is where women's solidarity, fantastic. Dolly says, oh, no problem. And so they, they immediately were sort of enlisted to help me. So around 2.30, they yanked me outside. There's Harry waiting to go on and speak. And Dolly says, this is Vicky Ward. She's been bombarding you with phone calls. You really have to talk to her. And he turned to me. and. He said, did you really write The Devil's Casino all by yourself? Uh, nice. <laughs> and, yeah, and, that you know, sounds like Casino Harry Macklow. The Devil's Casino was my first book. It was a New York Times bestseller about Lehman Brothers. So uh, anyway, I was like, yes, I really did. And, um, you know, it's always the way, you must know this, Stuart, that once you meet someone in person, the whole dynamic changes. And I think he phoned me at t classic Harry, 11 o'clock in the evening, that night, I learned that he never sleeps. And I was summoned to his office the next day, but it would still be a very long time before he said anything that was actually helpful. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of um, Harry jokes. Certainly probably yeah. wouldn't be printable now. No. But the, um, and I was like, how many days am I going to have to sit <laughs> in this man's office? So you just waited him out, I mean, essentially? He, well, he, you know, he, he did, he, he was highly entertaining. But, you know, and his then wife would phone, <laughs> and he would say, shh. <laughs> you know, he would put the phone call on speaker. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, he, you know, it, it was very hard not to be charmed by Harry. And, but I will say this on a, um, it, you know, it, it, in a sort of more, more serious note, what he did that was very clever was that he got to know me and he got to tell me the bits about himself he thought I would like that would Im impress me. But he was smart enough to know that there was a backstory. And he, without telling me that he, you know, he'd got what the guys I call the three Robs in the book. Mm -hmm. Rob Horowitz, Rob Soren, and uh, Rob Verone. He, he kind of made it possible for me to go talk to them. And so these three conciliary sat down with me and really gave me um, a lot of the story and Harry wasn't you know wasn't afraid of what they would say mm -hmm. um, anyway I'm not answering I'm I went on a detour from your original no, question, that was but but I would say this you know when I finished the book about Lehman Brothers um, I really felt like I had been interviewing soldiers of an army and that they were all part, I mean, everyone who had worked at Lehman Brothers was so loyal to Lehman Brothers. And that became actually the point of the book, how this idea of 
one firm which had saved Lehman, um, you know, a decade previously, became something sinister mm -hmm. and Orwellian. Um, but, you know, it was sort of like, I definitely felt when I had finished writing that book that all the people I'd interviewed, um, they'd definitely been in the same room. They may have had different points of view, but they'd been at the same meeting. The real estate guys, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> diverse <laughs> perspectives. <laughs> well, I mean, there was definitely no um, alignment uh, yes, I mean, I mean. That you seems know, like it's real estate in a nutshell. It's a bunch of <laughs> cowboys working at cross purposes and deals, sometimes coming together, but not not a cohesive army Definitely of any sort. Not. One of the things I love that you get in your books is that you get these guys who are not used to that, and then you really uh, get them to reveal themselves. And I think you did that with Harry Mackle, and even today we were talking about it earlier. Uh, you know, the fact that the He's a major subject of the book, and it was like, I only want to do a book with the key words and people. And you didn't go into that relationship thinking that it just sort of happened. No, I didn't, you know, I mean, I never know what the story is. I did, so after I wrote the book of, about Lehman Brothers, someone in your space um, met me for tea and said, you know, no, no, this might be a little grandiloquent. I don't think no one has ever written a book about the world of real estate. But basically he said, you know, you take people into a world. That's, that's what you do. And you tell these human stories that make that world come alive for people who don't know anything about it. And the world of real estate is so opaque. You know, you just read in the, in the papers or now, you know, on our screens that this building was just sold for X amount, but what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. what, what actually happens in those rooms? And there have been a lot of books about Wall Street. Um, Inda certainly had at that time. And um, so he's like, you know, if you, if you take a building, and the GM building would be an obvious one. It is, was then the most expensive piece mm -hmm. of commercial real estate in the country. And you use that as your narrative vehicle that the building becomes the protagonist then it's a great way to get in to the boardrooms mm -hmm. and it's a great way um to tell a story what i didn't know i mean initially i have to tell you i thought i was going to write a book about a guy called disc dean oh right who ran, the previous owner right yeah and that would have been a very short book yeah um so <laughs> and not a very fun one yeah <laughs> and um but I began to realize that the Harry story, um, I think spoke, it, at the risk of sounding, again, grand, it speaks to humanity. I mean, there is some, there is, Harry is like a Shakespeare right. hero. And, and that, that was my other question. It's like, because it speaks to all of real estate, like, you know, why does somebody risk it all like Harry? Why, what makes somebody a gambler like that willing to lose it all? Is it... I mean, I could get really psychoanalytical <laughs> right now, but what, what, wh why does somebody do that? <laughs> well, he's not the first. You know, interestingly, his, his role model was William Zeckendorf, mm -hmm. you know, who history will remember, I think, William Zeckendorf as, an, as a visionary. Mm -hmm. But the truth of it is he died. You know, it, it all went, you know, he also, like Harry, put, put his dice on Red 17. And, it, you know, one time it worked, and then another time it didn't. I mean, the, you know, the thing that I felt, because obviously the, the book is chiefly about Harry, but I go back and I, starting with Boss Tweed, mm -hmm. look at every person who's owned that piece of land. And there is a theme. It is like Jason and the Golden Fleece. You know, you have these audacious, very ego-driven, unfortunately, all men. Um, though there is a chapter about one woman um, who... Um, who's, who's really who's what makes them successful is also what brings them mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. and I think that that's the you know if Harry, Harry did something really bold and almost stupid to get the GM building mm -hmm. in the first place and, and the other thing I would say is about when he when he when disaster fell with the EOP deal 
the truth of it was that actually a year later he if you know if he'd been able oh, to right. buy he, himself he would have yeah he just yeah, yeah. but he so, but he but, but he risked it time as we know and, he, he would have outlasted the uh, he would have kept the buildings if he had just basically what basically the financial told the crisis creditors. The the, yes they didn't dip in the yeah. way that everyone expected yeah is there anything you think about him like just the rush of the deal and he just you know wants to constantly be in you know in the middle of a deal is that what also motivates him this is a non real estate comparison but i just watched last night um uncut gems with adam sandler and i think that's such a good like have you seen that such a good like you know a gambler who's always on the move and always wants to make deals and just can't stop like addicted to the action but i don't know if that's kind of what motivates him exactly but Seems like it's an inter interesting paradigm for for real estate too. Yeah, no, he definitely. Um, it is the uh, it is being in the deal, but there's more to this. People don't go out and um, risk that amount of money if it isn't about something more mm -hmm. fundamental. Like a grand vision. And ha yes, Harry definitely. It's not. I mean, anybody can be a deal junkie. Mm -hmm. This is about a legacy. Yeah. It's about making a statement. It's about um, being a visionary. Um, and, you know, what he did with the GM building. And, you, you know, no matter what happens to his financial fortunes, that his legacy will be, you know, he created the Apple um, headquarters. He turned that building into really an iconic building and that no, no one can take that yeah. away from him and so i think that sure he wanted to make a lot of money with but it was something to owning seven office buildings and making a statement in new york and obviously it went wrong but i think mm -hmm. it's it's more about making a statement than being a deal junkie mm -hmm. one of the interesting things in real estate that we cover from time to time is like family disputes and in the book he you know, and, and afterwards he ends up suing his son, suing his son-in-law, divorcing his wife of 50 years, putting up a billboard across the street from his wife's apartment of his new French wife. Um, <laughs> like what, what, is that just, he feels backed into a corner, he's, he's like, or, or what level of, how, how does that happen? Like, I just don't see how that happens on a human level. Well, he's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question. The Did you get a flavor of that when you were talking to him that he could be that combative, or just that if a push came to shove, he would, you know, or that's kind of hidden from view. Nobody, you know, comes no, across that so way. No. So actually, so here's here's the um, sort of irony of all of that is that actually. Um, even though, you know, Linda was on speakerphone um, and he was sort of going, shh, and there was some crisis with their, you know, billion dollar art collection. Um, uh, he actually was very careful never to talk her down to me and he was very mm -hmm. careful never to talk Billy, mm -hmm. his son, down to me and I'm pretty sure he didn't talk Kent Swig down mm -hmm. either. So in fact, but what he did do, it was very clever, was let everyone else do the talking oh. <laughs> to people he trusted. And um, so that was very shrewd. So I have, I have to say that, and the reason it was shrewd was because to me, Harry is a rascal and a rogue, but he, retain some elegance mm -hmm, by doing mm -hmm. that you know it's not very attractive for somebody to go there and right. you know put out all their dirty laundry like that and he didn't do it right 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 i feel like that's yeah i mean in, in washington dc you probably see similar tactics you don't want to you know um well that's There's yeah Says I can get it for you for 21. 
and he says, no, offer him 23 because I want these guys to know I'm serious. Yeah. And the fact that he's just able to say, here's a couple million dollars to know, for you to know that I'm serious, you know, to, and to show that side of him, because that must have been very revealing for him to like say that this is how I went after something. But yeah, I thought that was very impressive to get people to like sort of reveal their, their private sort of parts of them where they're trying to audition somebody else well that thank you <laughs> i mean that is part of what this is all about um you know it is about um first of all you have to get the access if you're me you have to go to the bloomberg conference on real estate and and you have to you have to find yourself in front of the guy you need to get in front of but once you've got the access um you do in my experience given the nature that I really do these deep dives, you really do have to build trust. And um, and you have to build trust with the person knowing that, you know, the person knows you might write something yeah, negative about them, which is even harder. Right, I mean, Harry now sometimes hands out my book and says, this is my um, memoir, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is, that was definitely not my intention. <laughs> Um, wasn't meant to be a hagiography, and I don't. I don't think. I don't think it is. But I also suspect that he wasn't completely taken by surprise by much in the book. Um, by the end, that that I had pretty much. I had gone to him with everything people had said, and you know. So I. I think that. I think he would say that I was fair to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, and that's really all you can do, right? I mean, life is a series of, yeah. of pros and cons. I always tell people who complain about our coverage. Um, yeah. But I want to talk about it, you know, another big real estate figure that you've written about the, the Kushners. And, um, you know, that was a book that came out later, Charlie Kushner, who became a billionaire in New York and New Jersey, you know, ended up going to jail for a bit. Uh, Jared, who parlayed the family fortune into um, you know, marriage with the Trumps, um, and also into the White House. Um, so, you know, well, into a much, much bigger fortune. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. You know, how, how did that book come about? Did, did Charlie talk to you for the book? Uh, you know, what, what? How did that kind of play out? That that reporting compared to the uh, the Macla reporting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I've known Donald Trump. Um, my first book, he said to my children, you know, your mother is the best writer in the world. <laughs> in the world. My kids were like, how well, it was 2010, so they're 20 now. Anyway, do the math. They, one of them said, Mr. Trump, what about J.K. Rowling? <laughs> and uh, and um, so I'm not sure that Donald Trump knew who J.K. Rowling was anyway. Mm -hmm. but the, I, and I had known Jared Kushner ever since he came to New York while his dad was actually in jail. And, um, and I should say, by the way, what Donald Trump's view of my second book, Of the Liar's Ball, was mm -hmm. not nearly so complimentary. Right. <laughs> was, um, because he owned the GM building for a time. He, d he did not like yeah. um, the chapters. And I actually th really thought they were fair, I have to say. I really thought they were fair. But, you know, he didn't see it that way. Nonetheless, he still, you know, he would still, when he won the presidential uh, nomination, he still took time out of his day to phone me yeah. and said, I've seen you're on TV. <laughs> you look good. So that's the really important thing. Yeah. The, um, that sounds so, um, the, so I, but in, the, in that 2016 campaign, I was writing a piece for Esquire magazine um, and I'd had a conversation with the editor where we were, and he was re revamping Esquire magazine, and the country was incredibly polarized, as it is now. And we thought, why don't we do a sort of cover story on the two Kushner brothers? Because it was sort of well known that Josh Kushner was a Democrat, and there was Jared um, working for his father-in-law on that campaign. And we had, so the, the genesis of that article, which then would turn into the book, was actually, wouldn't it be interesting to study two siblings divided and um, what that means? 
And uh, to be honest, in the reporting of that piece, it was it was much bigger lift for me to, I didn't know so much about the world of venture capital and Josh Kushner, and I had to really educate myself on that. I had known Jared. I had written a book on real estate. And I think that where, uh, you know, if I was his publicist, I would say he went wrong, was that he, you know, I heard things about him in my reporting that were not necessarily flattering about the way he conducted himself in some business meetings. And he called me in to meet with him and said, you know, I'm not going to talk to you uh, on the record, Vicky, mm -hmm. um, but I will talk to you off the record. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> but the problem was that in that off the record conversation, he revealed a littleness to him that I had not yet seen. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you what, uh, you know, what the contents of what he said, but I did, I came away. Like a pettiness or a little, what? He told me, you know, really scurrilous details about people who are not famous or important, mm -hmm. as if him not having published these stories in the New York Observer would somehow make oh. him out to be some great hero. And I came away, frankly, thinking I needed to take a bath. And, um, <laughs> And so, and so we, and we, I said to the editor of Esquire magazine, don't change a thing, run the story as is. And, and they then had, he and Ivanka, when the piece was published, you know, tried to get uh, David Lauder to pull advertising from Hearst. I mean, they, they, you, they sort of went nuclear, but there was, you know, we stood by the piece, it was accurate. But all of this left me with quite a strong impression. And as the Trump presidency rolled along, Jared and Ivanka gained incredible influence and um, power. And I sort of had kept an eye on what, on the 666 Fifth Avenue. And I knew that the Kushner family had, there was this ticking time bomb and I sort of, couldn't understand why the DC press was not focused on this. And, you know, I began to see something that I think is true. There's that report, you know, reporters get siloed, you know, DC focuses on DC. Mm -hmm. No one was really paying attention to the New York real estate aspect of this story. And in fact, the entire Trump White House was, you know, really all people had to do was actually look to the world of New York real estate for many mm -hmm. answers. And um, that's why I, I kind of thought, well, no one else is going to write this mm -hmm. book. I will. And I didn't really mind that Jared and Ivanka um, didn't talk because I sort of knew that their version of reality would be a reality distortion field. And what, what, but what was interesting was that Republicans were just as anxious to talk um, as Democrats because everybody felt alienated wow. um, back then. Do you think they're going to get back into politics ever again, or what's your uh, okay. prognosis on that? And, and 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 what did you think of Jared's autobiography? Well, I wrote a review of his. I know. I saw uh, the headline. I was I was beating you. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, that was a real fantasy by omission. Um, I think, um, you know, would they go back? I mean, look, I think it's entirely possible that Donald Trump could become president. And if he becomes president, um, you know, we know Jared and Ivanka go where, right. go where money and power are. So who knows? Yeah. How about the the family patriarch? Uh, I'm not saying this is true of Charlie Kushner, but you know you do see real estate moguls who you know I find this of some of the, the moguls we cover. You know, one day they'll be you know screaming at you. You know, 
I'm going to destroy you. And then two weeks later, you'll see them at a Knicks game and they'll smile at you. How's it going? And they have this, you know, very selective memory and or it's like a Jekyll and Hyde type <laughs> type thing. I never could figure out if it's like just super calculated or if it's like built into that type of person who just like just really, I don't know, has a filter for how they uh, or, or, or a lot of, con, you know, contain, contain, compartmentalize their lives. Right. Did well, you get a sense of that with him? Yeah. I mean, that was the whole, you know, they're just to, to Jekyll and Hyde, I think is a very good way, um, very good way of putting it. I mean, my, you know, I say in the book I, that, um, you know, that the deal that bailed out 666 Fifth Avenue wasn't always going to be a lease. But, you know, I think I report in the book that the seat there then CEO of Brookfield was so put off by Charlie's <laughs> ravings that um, that's why it ended up being structured differently. Mm -hmm. Can you go into that? So, and I have to remember my own book at this point. Um, but as I recall, um, and I'm trying to remember what it was that Charles Kushner um, did do, that that you know they were they were actually thinking of um, buying the building. Um, but I, if our memory serves, Charlie Kushner gave an interview. It may, who could it have been to? Um, and he, it was, <laughs> that's what I, it was, with, <laughs> that's I'm being facetious. Yes. <laughs> it was, it was with um, the real deal in which he went off, if, I, if memory mm -hmm. serves. Yeah, <laughs> and he started the interview off with what do you assholes want or something like that. Uh, right. That, was the, that, was, that set the uh, tone for the interview. Right. And so I, uh, if memory serves, my, what I say in the book is that, you know, Rick Clark, the then CEO of Brookfield, was so, like, alarmed at, uh, at all of this that that's when they decided to, to structure the deal as a, as a lease that was paid up mm -hmm. front. And I think he was so frustrated that the whole press corps was examining Jared so closely. And I think that there, that was, you know, there was just a lot, a lot going on at the time. Um, so, you know, I don't want to take away any future book ideas, but are there other areas of real estate that, you know, you left on the cutting room floor or, you oh, know, sure. the greatest untold areas of real estate that should be mined? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the... Um I do think, and who was I talking to here earlier? Um, I, I remember. Um, I do think that the rise, that it's particularly interesting time geopolitically, and the Middle East um, is at a really interesting juncture. And I do think that the story of Middle East and its control on, or not, in very big influence on real estate here is a particularly topical story. Um, you know, if you look at what Mohammed bin Salman um, has achieved these last few months, and you consider that only five years ago he was sort of the pariah of the world, it's a remarkable and remarkably swift U-turn. And so I think it's, um, you know, and you also look at his, how his relationship with his former mentor, Mohammed bin Zayed, the United Arab Emirates, how that has completely broken down. I think that all these different shifts are really fascinating mm -hmm. and worth looking at. All right, we're gonna we're gonna look into that more. The real deal. Um, I wanted to ask you just a general, you know, journalism background question. You're English. I'm American. I, 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 oh, well, <laughs> yeah, but you have I an, am English, you have an English well. accent. Yeah. You came from England yeah. and kind of came up through the, you know, it, for lack of a better word, the, the the Tina Brown school of journalism. And Tina Brown was, 
your editor at Vanity yeah. Fair and, you know, such a, such a famous editor. Um, you know, you, you cover all these figures, and I want to get to some of the, the new stuff in a second, but you cover some of these figures. Like, what did she teach you about covering these figures and or, you know, how you go up against people that are powerful and, and write, you know, stories that are unvarnished? Well, you know, Tina is fearless. I mean, Tina is a brilliant editor, but she's also a brilliant journalist. And, um, you know, I never forget that one, it was, it was Talk magazine, and I forget that at one point we didn't have a cover. And she just sort of slung her purse over her shoulder and said, right, I'm going out to, I think it was Giorgio Armani's birthday, I'm going to report. <laughs> I will come back with wow. the cover. With a cover? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and, you know. That's nuts. Um, and, you know, she, she never became uh, too grand to, to not be focused on the important thing, which is the story. And, um, you know, I think, um, if anything, she, probably, she taught me to be, f you have to be fearless. You cannot think, uh, you can't really think that failure is an option. You just have to, you have to go get Harry Macklow and you have to be convinced that this book is going to happen and he has to be convinced that this book is going to happen with or without him and that's that's what then bends wow that's the perfect story of having faith that the story is out there yeah. going out and yeah saying oh, i'm going to go out and find a cover story you know it's a that's ambitious and uh, you know having a lot of faith in your abilities yeah. to, to uncover things um well i want to talk about you know one or two of the recent projects and obviously people you know questions from from anybody but um you know you've been working on um you know chasing Ghislaine. uh that was a project that you mm -hmm. worked on jeffrey epstein associate um who was convicted of you know helping epstein line up victims and you know you had a Substack post earlier um do you think it's the end end of the line for the epstein reporting as far as the people who helped him or there's still more to be uncovered there and will anything more be uncovered well, that's like an endless piece of string. I mean, who would have thought that all these years later, you know, I first met Jeffrey Epstein in 2002. I was pregnant with my twin sons. I remember this because he threatened them, the birth, etc. Oh. And, um, uh, but I would, you know, at that point, nobody knew who Jeffrey Epstein was. So the fact that you've got all these stories um, about, you know, I mean, at this point, I hate to say this, it's like, almost like a parlor game. You know, if you didn't know Jeffrey Epstein, then who are you? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's the number of people who took business meetings with him, who knew him, who somehow got manipulated by him is extraordinary. And, you know, chasing Ghislaine, it's not really about Ghislaine Maxwell. It was really an, an attempt to look at the story of the men and the money, because without mm -hmm. the men and the money, he could never have done what he did um, in abusing underage girls. So um, do I think that that story will keep running? Well, there's still a lawsuit. Um, there are still several lawsuits. The JP Morgan suit, I believe, is, not, you know, is, is scheduled to go to trial. So yes, I do think there is more to come. Mm -hmm. And in doing the story, what, did you find out about what made, you know, her tick, Ghislaine, tick as far as helping him through all those years? No, I mean, what I say in the podcast um, is, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell's father, Robert Maxwell, was a very complicated, dark man. She was his favorite child. And, you know, the despite the fact that she spoke many languages, had an Oxford degree, had a Rolodex that all of us would love to have. She um, believed that, she, you know, she came to be completely dependent on Jeffrey Epstein, I think as she saw it, for survival, and that took her down mm -hmm. a really dark path. Mm -hmm. And it just became this web of right. interdependency. and Right. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask, you know, the last question, unless anybody have it, because I've kind of come full circle here. 
you know, what we're talking about, you know, exposing money and power and, 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 and really going deep on that, you know, what, what led you to become a journalist in the first place? Like, what led you to <laughs> explore all this stuff? So that's really easy. I'm very nosy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gen, you know, I'm genuinely interested in um, people. I really am, and you know, sometimes, you know, it is, you know, I go out to dinner, and you know, at my advanced age, you know, a lot, a lot of people I meet are considering their retirement, and I just can't imagine, you know, that as long as I have my health, I would, you know, I just kind of get out of bed in the morning, and I'm just driven, driven to pick up the phone and then write it all down. Mm -hmm. That's just, it's just mm -hmm. who I am. And just reflexively write it, write yeah. it all down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think at the core of it and, and your work, you know, so clearly illustrates this, it's like what makes people tick and it's just an endless puzzle of trying to piece that together and, you know, you have these extreme cases and these extreme personalities and these larger than life figures and trying to puzzle that all together with those types of people is, you know, it's, it's just endlessly interesting and fascinating and, um, Thank you for coming oh, up here today and you, running through everything and, and how you do it, how you do your job. Thank you for <laughs> having me. Thanks, guys.